Heads or tails? As I made mention of in the last study and in several of my previous studies, we're all being played by the powers that be. And not just by them, but by the things that are happening in the world. I mean, just look at what is going on in the world right now. All the carnage and troubles in the world and here at home. Earthquakes, droughts, fires, viruses, murders in the streets, crime at all-time highs. And there is now a huge influx, or should I say invasion, by so-called victim immigrants flooding into Europe. And many of those will be brought here to the United States and released amongst our populace with no real checks or balances to know whether they are radical terrorists or not or to know whether they are actually victims or not. I would utter to guess that only a small percentage of the people fleeing into Europe are actually victims. But back here at home, we still have our own problems. We have an open border with illegals crossing over it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what do we do? We reward them. Our politicians, without fail, do that which is unjust to our own nation. And why do they do it? Well, for their own greed, for their own gain. And because many of them are no doubt controlled or persuaded in one way or another. Sometimes you have to look at the illegal side and say, well, if you were in their shoes and you could get into America and get all these entitlements and all these freebies and all these things, what would you do? Well, I guess that all depends on what your standing is with our father and how you want our father to look at you. There are many illegals who come to this country and work very hard. However, there are others that come here and do things they shouldn't do. This influx of illegals are not punished for breaking the law. That is why they are called illegals. You know, the word illegal has a meaning in the dictionary. Look it up. It means not lawful, breaking the law. Some of them come here, as we've seen on the news in the past few months, and kill people. Or they join gangs or they deal drugs, some of them even human traffic each other. A few are deported, but when they're deported, they simply come right back across the border, which is still open, and flee into sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities where the morons, who are bleeding hearts, are tightening the noose around their own necks and our necks. But there is a deeper agenda to all of this. Those of you who are expecting a rant from me, well, you're not going to be disappointed. However, when it comes to speaking the truth, it's a hard thing to do these days because truth does not fit the narrative nor the conventional wisdom of the modern day, which has meticulously been set up to make anyone speaking the truth or speaking with righteous indignation, that is, anyone who dares to speak up, end up being labeled and numbered with racists or bigots or trolls or shills or anything they want to call you, However, the truth will prevail in the end. Maybe not now, but in the end it will prevail. 
With that in mind, I'm going to read a letter which was published recently in a prominent newspaper. And someone has taken it and now posted it online. This is an open letter from an emergency room doctor. And I will withhold his name. But this is what the doctor had to say. Dear Sirs, I live and work in a state overrun with illegals. They make more by having kids than we earn working full time. Just today, I had a 25-year-old patient with eight kids. That's right, eight. All of them illegal anchor babies. And she had the nicest painted fingernails, the nicest cell phone, a nice handbag, and the nicest clothing, and etc. She makes about $1,500 monthly for each of her anchor babies. You do the math. I used to say we are the dumbest nation on earth. Now I must say sadly and admit we are the dumbest people in the universe. That includes myself. For we elected the idiot ideologues who have passed these bills that allow this. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but we need a revolution. Some points I would like to bring to mind. If the illegal immigrant who comes into this country is over 65 years of age, they can apply for SSI and Medicaid and get more than a man or woman on Social Security who worked from 1944 till 2004. In most cases, a male or female who worked for those years gets $791 per month because they were born in 1924. And there is a catch-22 notch for them. It is interesting that the federal government provides a single refugee with a monthly allowance of $1,890. Each can also obtain additional assistance of $580 in social entitlements for a total of $2,470 a month. Compare this to a single pensioner who, after contributing to the growth and development of America for 40 to 50 years, can only receive a monthly maximum of $1,012 in old age pension and guaranteed income supplement. Maybe our elderly pensioners should apply as refugees. Consider sending this letter to all your American friends so we can all get ticked off and maybe get the refugees cut to 10 and 12 a month, that is 1,012 a month, and get the pensioners up to 2,470. Then we can enjoy some of the money we were forced to pay in to submit to the government over the last 40, 50, or 60 years. And of course this is has the doctor's name, but I will not say it here. And that was the end of the letter. Now, this is not right, of course. It's not fair. And most people with half a brain know this. However, most are afraid to speak up or to say or do anything about it. because of the fear of being labeled. Now, besides the illegals coming into this country, you have others which have been born in the United States, but honor the land of their ancestry and not the United States, which has given them more freedoms than their homelands ever did, which is why their ancestors came here in many cases, 
Some, of course, were bought here, but have reached a standard of living higher than anywhere else in the world, even in poverty. These people do not honor the United States, nor our laws, nor our Constitution, and they consistently vote for socialism. They vote in socialist to power. They breed hate and whine and moan and cause division. And this is part of the great narrative that I was speaking of earlier. In fact, the whole in-game goal is to cause as much division and confusion as possible. To rewrite history to a blissfully unaware public who have never known true history because history was never taught to them. History teaches us by the examples of the past. The Bible teaches us by the examples of the past and tells us that which is right and moral. So then, both history and the Bible must either be rewritten to propagate lies and to push hate and to censor the correct history and to censor all biblical knowledge. In fact, God's truth must be purged altogether in lieu of this new order. Now this was not done overnight. It has come about slowly, inch by inch. If someone had tried to do this all at once, they would have been thrown out of office, tarred and feathered, pelted with tomatoes, and chased out of town. So they did it slowly, over decades, maybe even longer. But this is being, being done slowly with the purpose of breaking down the moral fiber, of breaking down the family unit, to remove the norms of sexual behavior, to confuse the role of male and female, which is why there has been this great push for homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgender all of a sudden over the past couple of decades. This is also done to separate mankind into political factions and parties, which are all really part of one big ruse and sham because they're all the same. You've got these on the left that stand up and tout for socialism, and you've got those on the right who say that they're not socialist, but when they get into office, what do they do? They push for the socialist things and do not the, uh, overturn the things they said they were going to overturn. They're a bunch of do-nothings. Another thing they do, not necessarily just the politicians, but the media, the narrative is to feed us on conspiracies, some based in truth, others based in what people in their paranoid minds want to believe because of how things appear to their eyes. But can people go by what things look like only? Oftentimes, no. The truth sometimes is stranger than fiction. Yet people still believe and push these things, which works even further to break us down into groups of those who believe this and those who believe that. Also, we are broken down into ethnicities, which tolerate but hate each other. Unless, of course, they're grounded in the truth. But of the rest who do tolerate at times and hate each other privately or publicly, they're being pushed with a constant barrage and message of inequality, bias, and hate. When the real inequality 
is being practiced against the law abiding, against the taxpayer, against the Christian faithful. And this is what the powers that be fear. Because if people come to the truth and unite in the truth, under God, under Christ, then these people become powerless. But such is not the case. Even Christianity has been infiltrated and divided into denominations, into different churches, which cannot stand each other. Outside religions, likewise, have been in the same way overtaken by radicals. And all of this done to divide human beings in the most effective ways possible to bring about this narrative and this agenda. The goal for now is to divide. But the end goal is to reunify humanity. Oh yes, to reunify humanity as one under the new religion, which will of course be set by the global government, headed up by the false messiah, which is none other than Satan himself, the Antichrist. And it's all a matter of controlling that narrative and making people believe what they want to believe or what they want us to believe, rather. How do they do this? By playing on man's fears, by cultivating their hatred, patting them on the back and saying, you have been done wrong, by giving them gifts, entitlements, and so on, for votes, by feeding them outright lies, by taking away freedoms, and per replacing them with perceived rights and entitlements by removing God's truth from them, by telling them that the most perverse of sins, which are a delight to the flesh, are A-OK. -okay. In short, by removing God and his word from their hearing. To totally change the narrative from what it had been and the truth from what it had been and to create a new order of chaos, a new order of confusion, to bring again Babylon, the Babylon of the end times, be turning, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy. As I have alluded to a number of times, Deuteronomy 28 speaks of what is going on right now. It also speaks historically. But as you know, when I teach these things, I will allude to the historical part, which is important for us to know. Again, we must know history in order that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. But I tend to teach along the more prophetical lines of how it affects us today and how it will affect us. So, Deuteronomy chapter 28, the... Uh, some of the final words of Moses. And before we begin reading this chapter of our Father's Word, let us, as always, go before our Father's throne and ask for wisdom, guidance, and understanding from our Heavenly Father. So let us pray. Our glorious Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, Father, to ask for wisdom and guidance and understanding of these things. We know, Father, that you are the heart knower, that you have the ability, Father, to sprinkle us with that latter rain of truth 
so that we may know the truths written within your word and understand them. So we ask, Father, that you show us the truth, that you shine the light of truth upon us. We ask that you open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths, Father. And we ask this to the pleasing of your good will. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Again, this is historical and prophetical, but I choose to teach more along the prophetical and how it affects us and how it will affect this last generation, the generation of the fig tree. So Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. You have an odd thing with this chapter. You've got the word and to begin it here. That's a polysendenton. It means there's more said. And it shall come to pass, if thou shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all of his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Now we know for a short time Israel did do the will of God. And they did hearken to the voice of God, and God gave them the victory. And he did set Israel higher above the rest of the nations. Why? Because they were his favorites? Not necessarily. It is because Israel are God's chosen. Why are they chosen? They were chosen in the earth age that was. No doubt because they stood with God when Satan tried to overthrow God in the earth age that was at the Catabol. God is not a respecter of persons. He loves all the races and he loves all people. It is people's actions and their sins and their disobeying of our Father and his word which drives a rift between our Father and his people. And again, as I've alluded to a number of times, the word and name Israel is not simply bound to a race of one people. Historically, it was. But Israel means the prince that prevails with God, the prince that has power with God. If you're a Christian, you are counted for the seed. It doesn't matter what people you come from, what nation you come from. You are counted for the seed. You are counted with Israel, a part of Israel, even a part of the seed of Abraham. Not by bloodline, but by adoption. Which means there is no difference. You're still family, and you're still joint heirs with Christ. Some people just cannot get past the fact that, well, I don't want to be adopted. I want to be one of the children of Israel. Well, you know, a lot of times if you look at Israel's history, Israel did very unsavory things that angered God. God even killed many of the Israelites himself because they made him so angry. And he cast them out of the promised land. So being of Israel by bloodline is not all it's cracked up to be unless you use the power which God gave you in it. But now anyone can claim that power because Christ came and gave up his life to save the world. Not just Israel, the world. Verse 2. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if, here's your qualifier, thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Well, how do you hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God? Does God speak to us today? Well, he does through his word. That is why it's called the word of God. 
It is the voice of God on paper. I know that there are many people who say the Lord spoke to me today and said this, or the Lord spoke to me and said that, or the Lord showed me this vision, or the Lord showed me that vision. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. People, I think, have trouble discerning the spirits, and if something does not align with God's word, you can pretty much tell that it wasn't God talking to them. How do you know that? Well, you've got to be familiar with our Father's word. Let's continue with the book. Chapter, excuse me. Verse 3. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. In other words, it don't matter whether you're out in the country or in the city, you're going to be blessed. But again, the qualifier. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Verse 4. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. In other words, that's your children that you're going to bring forth in generations. And the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. In other words, you're going to have plenty. You're going to want for nothing. Your ground's going to produce. You're going to have cattle, sheep. Uh, by today's standard, you know, many of us do not farm or uh, uh, have sheep or cattle. But you know what? We can go right down to the supermarket and buy a steak or buy a chicken or buy whatever we want to eat. Plenty there. So when you read this, don't look only at the historical. Look at how it might be said to, in today's language. In other words, there's plenty to go around. But it is changing. Verse 5. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. In other words, your basket is that which you hold your stuff in. Uh, you know, I like to use the analogy of going into the store and pushing a basket with this. Blessed is going to be your basket. It's going to be full. And thy store. In other words, the things you store up so that you'll have stuff in times of trouble. Verse 6. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. What, do you, what could you want more than that? Blessed coming in, blessed going out. But remember what the qualifier was. Verse 7. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before these seven ways. Now, you can look at the historical of this, and remember how the tribes of Israel always had the victory, and the United States, and how we always had the victory. We even had the victory at times when it was a stalemate, because we stopped communism in its tracks. So much so that Russia finally imploded on itself. Still seething under the pot, though. However, look at the communist nations, the socialist nations in the world today. They're the most unsuccessful nations in the world. Where shelves are barren most of the time, where a lot of people don't have cars, where there are dictators, where there's heavy taxation and rules. And that's being brought upon us here in our own land. Verse 8. The Lord shall command a blessing upon thee and thy storehouses, and in all thou settest thy hand unto. In other words, you're going to prosper in everything you do when you stay in the Lord. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God shall give thee. You know, a lot of people say that we came over here and did genocide to the Indians. And in many cases, that can be argued legitimately. America has had a bloody past, and they have done unsavory things to peoples. However, the Lord did give us this land. There is no kingdom that has ever been set up that was not ordained by God, save of the kingdom of Satan. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. God called him my servant.
But my point here is, he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's not only talking about the land of Canaan, the promised land, Palestine, Judea. That's wherever Israel went. Verse 9. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Again, the qualifier. Verse 10. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. You know, one nation under God, the superpower of superpowers. Well, Russia was a superpower, yeah, but they were never the superpower the United States was. They had enough power that they could have destroyed us with them, but that wasn't written of in our Father's Word. And as I alluded to, they overspent themselves and finally imploded, and communism fell. And the United States remained. <clears throat> the United States has had freedom and liberties like no other nation ever in history. And now we would give that all away. It boggles the mind. Verse 11. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods. Remember when the United States became a real mechanized nation, a real superpower of importing and exporting? Things were actually made in America. The Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods. In the fruit of thy body. In other words, you, you're going you're gonna to become a, a, a multitude of people. Just as God promised Abraham. As the stars of heaven and the sands of the seashore. And in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy ground. In the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Again, historically the land of Canaan. The promised land. But everywhere that Israel has gone and migrated to. This is how you know who Israel actually is amongst the rest of the people of the world. And do you know that many of those other nations have been blessed by Israel? Because they have come into Israel. They've come to Christianity, and they too have become blessed. Yet many of them still moan and whine about the past. It's always easier to whine about things rather than get out there and make them better. Verse 12, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season, unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. That kind of tell you where we are these days? Having to borrow from Russia? Having to borrow from Saudi Arabia, from Japan? Sending money to China and Mexico hand over fist? Having to borrow from people that hate us and call us the great Satan? Having to buy their oil at the price they set? I guess that's why we're so afraid to not bring any of them over here. And why we're so bigoted. Either that or we just don't want to be blown up. Verse 13. The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. If. Remember that. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. Verse 14. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day. That means you are not to depart from the words of God. To the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Now many people do not keep God's law anymore. 
Well, what about Christ? What about him? Christ was God. Emmanuel, God with us. What about it? He came here and said the words that are pleasing to God and made a way for all to come to heaven so that we didn't have to do animal sacrifices anymore or, or follow the blood statutes and ordinances. Those things were done away with by his sacrifice. Not because we quit doing them in uh, being at variance with God. A lot of people don't understand that. But the law is still the law. There were only minor things done away with. But everything else still is intact. All the Ten Commandments, all the laws against perversion, they're all still intact. Now, verse 15 on here, we're going to see the reverse of this. We're going to see what happens to a nation or a people who do not listen to God. And it ought to wake a lot of you up to what's going on in our own nation even now. And not only our own nation, but other nations. Europe. Everywhere where Christianity is spread abroad to. So verse 15. But. Big word there. But. See, not that's not and. That's but. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So you've got your negative qualifier there. Here's what's going to come to pass, in modern English, let me say, here's what's going to come to pass if you do not hearken to the voice of the Lord God and observe his commandments, his laws, and his statutes. And again, this is concerning the ones that have relevance. Well, why don't they all have relevance? Well, because things were done away with, like circumcision. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to do animal sacrifices anymore. Why? Because Christ became our sacrifice. It's an abomination now to sacrifice an animal. It's like saying Christ is not good enough. We still have to offer animals. But anyway, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Verse 16. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. That's the opposite of the, previous, or the, or the earlier verse. Look at all the crime in the big cities now. Look at how trashy they are. Look at Detroit. Look at Chicago. Look at New York City for that matter. Look at all the homeless people laying on the streets holding up signs. Look at all the factories which have departed and gone. Due to politics and greed. And due to fines and levies and unions and taxation. Verse 17. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. In other words, you're not going to be able to store up food and your basket's going to have very little in it. Hey, go to the store sometime now. You know, I remember you used to, when I was a kid, you could go to the store and you could fill up a basket and, a, and part of another basket for about 50 or 60 bucks. Try it now. Even if you go to a cheaper supermarket where they sell uh, dollar goods or whatever, or, or cheaper things, you're still going to end up spending 150 bucks for about maybe half to three quarters of a basket if you're lucky and you're a smart shopper and you use coupons. Verse 18. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land and the increase of kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body. That's your children. And boy, aren't they cursed being brainwashed with Darwinist evolution and myth and sexual lifestyles and look how, look how they act towards their parents. Look how they dress now. You see 12 and 13 year old girls dressed up like little harlots. And you see kids dressed up in gang thug attire. 
12 and 13 years old, smarting off at their grandparents and their parents. When what they really need is uh, a little bit of rod of correction on their hind end, a little bit of heat. Verse 19. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest out in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. In other words, whether you're coming or going, you're going to be cursed. And why? Because you did not hearken to the word of God. You allowed things to come to pass and just said, well, we mustn't judge. We should let the gays and lesbians be married. And we should do away with prayer in schools. And we should arrest Christians who pray in lunchrooms or who refuse, based on their beliefs, to issue gay marriage license or to bake a cake for people who want to live perversely. Look at our justice system falling apart. You know, our Constitution was taken from the Word of God. And yet they say the Word of God is unconstitutional. Go figure. That violates the separation of church and state. An investigation was mounted in today into a high school coach who was caught praying after a football game. <gasps> oh my God! Are you serious? He prayed after a football game? I hope they arrested him and threw him to the ground and tased him. I mean, what a horrible thing to do. How offensive to pray at a football game. You know, the stupidity of man boggles the mind. Sometimes, if there is a case for evolution, that would be it. Because I think primates sometimes are smarter than men, mankind are. At least they know their loyalties. Verse 20. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing and vexation and rebuke. You know what it means when God rebukes something? Why does God rebuke? That's correction. It means you're abominable in his sight. And all that thou settest thy hand for to do, until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. I ask you, has the United States of America forsaken the God that begat them? Well, not all of us have. But a lot have. A growing number of atheists and homosexuals becoming college professors and running in the media, brainwashing kids with their secular nonsense so that kids are so confused they don't even know what to believe, and kids grow up angry. They grow up with almost heathenish rage when they've got nothing to be enraged about. They live in the greatest country in the world, and they're mad. They're rebellious. They've got nothing to lose. Bullshit. Your life is what you make of it. And if you want to sit back and say, Oh, woe is me. I have been disenfranchised. I have been done wrong. I don't have the opportunities that other people have. I'll never amount to anything because life didn't paint a rosy road for me then that is the way you're going to live. Making excuses. Verse 21. The Lord shall make pestilence, or the pestilence, excuse me, cleave unto thee, until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. Again, historically, you saw what happened to Israel when they strayed from God. Two captivities, Assyria and Babylon, and then Rome. But they didn't learn, and people today seldom even know the truth about those captivities. A lot of people don't even know the truth about what World War II or World War I or the Civil War was about. Oh, they do know what the Civil War was about, at least the uh, politically correct definition. It was over slavery. Sorry, it was not. It was over tax and tariff.
Slavery didn't even enter into it until 1862 or 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation. Verse 22. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with extreme burning, and with the sword, and with a blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. I want you to uh, do a little homework now. I don't think any of you have any trouble understanding what consumption is, or fever, or inflammation, or with extreme burning. But what about these words like blasting and mildew? Well, let's look up the word blasting. It is word H, which is Hebrew, 7711. It is Shadepha. And it comes from 7710, which means a blight, a blasting or blasted. From word H7710, Shadaf, which is its primitive root, which means to scorch, to blast, mildew, of H3420, Yerakon, which means a paleness, of 3418, a paleness whether of persons, from fright, or of plants from drought, greenish to yellow, or greenish yellow, of H3418, Yerek, properly polor. In example, i.e., hence the yellowish green of a young, sickly plant of vegetation. Concretely, verdure, i.e., grass or vegetation. Grass, green thing, in other words, it's a heating blast which causes the vegetation to be sickly or causes it to dry up. And that's from 3417, which means to spit, but spit. In other words, what I've given you there is the definition of both words. In other words, blasting, H7711 and 7710, and mildew, H3420, 3418, and 3417. You know what it means to spit in 3417, right? Remember what God said, I will spew you out of my mouth? You can even look at it sort of as a hissing. But actually it means spit as in, you know. Now let's go back to verse 23 of Deuteronomy 28. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. What does that mean? Well, that's two pieces of metal there, brass and iron. It means the heavens are going to be hardened, not going to bring forth any rain. And it also means that your screaming out to God is going to bounce off of that brass. Not that God doesn't hear you, but he's not going to answer. Why should he? And the earth that is underneath thee shall be like iron. Okay? What does that mean? It means the earth is going to be hard. You're not going to be able to plow it. It's going to be like iron. This is an analogy. This is a metaphor of speech. It means you're going to have a hard old time with all of it. You're not going to get any of the rain to water the ground, and the ground's going to be hard as iron. In other words, you ain't going to have any good feeding land for your animals, and you ain't going to have any good crops. You're not going to be able to sow. 
spiritual connotation to that too if you want to take it that way as far as sowing seed and reaping it. It means you got a lot of hard heads. Verse 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. That means dried up, withholding the rain. From heaven it shall come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Verse 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. In other words, the opposite of before. And thou shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. In other words, you're going to be dispersed off of the Holy Land. If you want to take this to today's terms, you're going to be consumed by the nations of the earth, the other kingdoms. They're going to have the mastery over you. Verse 26. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the earth. My, my, my. Where do we read of fowls of the air in the Bible and beasts of the earth? Let's see. The book of Revelation? The book of Daniel? Christ even spoke of the fowls of the air. A lot of you should know what those are. We're not necessarily talking about birds, though the uh, vulture is that which eats up the dead carcass. We're talking about fallen angels here. We're talking about the locust army. And no man shall fray them away. Why? Because man can't do anything about them. Verse 27. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt. And with emrods, emrods, of course, is hemorrhoids, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. We're going to look up another word here. Botch. It is the word Hebrew 78.22. Shekin. It is from an unused root, probably meaning to burn with inflammation, an example, an ulcer, a boil, a sore, botch. You know, there's a lot of diseases out there in the world these days. A lot of things that can't be healed. Verse 28. And the Lord shall smite thee with madness. That's derision, anger, confusion. And blindness and astonishment of heart. And heart, obviously, mind. This means you're, you're going to have blindness of the heart and mind and astonishment at what you see. And this also alludes to the fact that blindness, you're not going to have eyes to see. And you're not going to understand why such bad things are happening to us. In other words, blissfully unaware why does God allow bad things to happen? Well, he's telling you in his word, and he's told you in a number of places. Have you read it? Verse 29. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness. In other words, you're going to be reaching around trying to find something to hold on to, because you can't see in noonday. In other words, the example is here, you're going to be spiritually blind. You're going to be groping in the darkness. Darkness is always symbolic of deception in the Bible. You're going to be in deception. Is the world not in deception now for allowing the things to come to pass, for our freedoms to be removed and taken from us, for our God and prayer and normal things to be taken from us? And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. You're only going to be oppressed and spoiled evermore, even more. Hey, the farther you go from God, the farther you're going to be oppressed and spoiled. And the spoil's going to be taken from you and given to someone else, quite frankly. Verse 30. 
Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Boy, talk about prophecy. You know, I think I alluded to this in the last lecture, and all the infidelity that's going on in the world now, and how easy the inner makes it for people to screw around on their spouse. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Can't afford to. Or we got a divorce, and we had to divide the house, and now someone else has got the house. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and thou shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Somebody else is going to get them. Verse 31. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken from before thy face, and shall not be restored thee, or to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. You remember what I was talking about earlier when I read the letter from the doctor? Not that the immigrant peoples are our enemies, but, uh, you know, anyone who enters this country and votes for socialism and votes to boot God out because of gifts and entitlements is the enemy of God because they profess to be Christians. And do you know what an ox and an ass signify? Well, an oxen and an ass are burden-bearing creatures. In other words, they're beasts of burden. Which means without them, you cannot plow or work. In these times, they pulled your cart. They hauled heavy loads for you. And if you translate this to modern terminology, all of your abilities to work and make a living shall be taken from you. Well, let's think about that. Shipping jobs overseas, illegals coming in and taking jobs, and your money, and your benefits, and your retirement that you've paid in for? Again, you can scarcely blame them. But even they ought to know that God said, you shall work for that you eat. Not have it given to you. You don't take from others. You don't accept entitlements and say, woe is me, I've suffered, and I deserve to live like this. I deserve to sit on my porch and swing and drive off in my new Cadillac Escalade and go down and get my welfare and my wick and my snap and my free cell phone and my free gas cards. And I deserve low-income housing. And those evil people deserve to pay for it. What evil people? Your brother and sister Christians? Verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. That's bondage. And that did happen historically. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thy hand. In other words, you will not be able to stop it and you will have no strength to stand up to it. Basically, false teachers are going to take them. Strangers are going to come in and overtake you in your own land. And they're going to take your wealth and your possessions. Kind of like paying people to have kids. And leaving veterans who fought for this country and retirees who paid into this country with not enough to live on. As illegals have plenty because they're pandered to by our government, by socialists and secularists, whom they all join together with on the left-hand side of the aisle and even in some cases on the right. But your children are being taken from you even in your schools. They're being taught that our God is a myth. And as I keep saying, and not only in your schools, but Ivy League schools, they're being taught gay and lesbian lifestyles and that it's normal and completely acceptable. They're being stolen from you. Verse 33. 
The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. In other words, you're going to be dwindled down to nothing. You're going to be oppressed. Verse 34. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou see. In other words, it's going to drive you crazy. You're going to be angry and furious. But how many of us, and I really shouldn't say us, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm talking about anyone in particular personally here, because I know many of you know the truth of our Father's Word, especially if you're listening. But there are those who have put us in this position. They have voted for these socialists. They put these ideologues in power. And as they've claimed more power, the more ground they've taken from us as Christians. Verse 35. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees, and then the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. You know, that is a disease that's throughout your body, from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Let's see now. AIDS? Let's see. What are some diseases you can't get rid of? Herpes. Bunch of venereal diseases out there. Gonorrhea, syphilis. How about Ebola? Yeah. How about flesh-eating bacteria? How about cancer? Which we probably have cures for a lot of these things, but we can't put the big uh, companies out of business that sell us the drugs. So you've got cancer, you've got many things, many different diseases and viruses out there, sicknesses. You even have the bubonic plague is back now. Y'all read that the other night? The bubonic plague has shown up in two of the United States. Is it that special? Yeah, I haven't been around in a long time. One might start to question things like that and say, you know, that seems mighty much like a vial being poured out or... Maybe even like a cursing. Verse 36. The Lord shall bring thee, and thy king which thou hast set over thee, over a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there thou shalt serve other gods, wood and stone. Now historically we know we're talking about the kingdom of Assyria here, the kingdom of Babylon, and yes, even Rome, as I alluded to earlier, but uh, we're also talking about the Antichrist here. Because you got lowercase on the word king here, which means not the king of kings and lords of lords. And he's going to be set up over thee, a nation which neither thy fathers nor thy have known. In other words, it's going to be something new which has not been around before. Maybe the abomination of desolation. Maybe mystery Babylon, the mother, the biggest of harlots and abominations of the world. And you're going to serve other gods, wood and stone. Historically, this would happen. People did worship false gods made of wood and stone covered over with metal. But don't just look at the historical. It means they're serving that which is not God. And anything that you put before you can be made an idol. I don't care what it is. It's a type of you being taken into captivity. And being taken to their gods. Well, what gods? Well, let's see. What about radical Islam? What about secular theology? Which is the religion of flesh man having no deity. But it's still a religion. It's still a creed people live by. It's stuff that people feel so strongly about till they'll go before the Supreme Court. And they'll say, but it's not religious. It's not a religion. Bullcrap. It is, though. It's just a deityous religion. Deity-less, excuse me. Verse 37. And thou shalt become an astonishment and a proverb. In other words, a saying and a byword among all nations whither the Lord shall lead thee. Boy, look at our nation now. 
You know, we're a laughing stock to the world. And, and look at Europe now. You know, the leaders over there saying, we openly welcome in all the refugees. Wait till you've got mosques on every street corner, buddy. Think you're going to openly welcome them then? Wait till they start dictating to you Sharia law. Wait till your buildings start blowing up. You know, <clears throat> there are many cases in Europe which have gone undocumented. Some have gone documented. But one I remember from a few years ago was two radicalized Islamic people that chopped a man up on the streets of Great Britain. And that's with just a few Muslims. Actually, it's, it's more than a few in Britain nowadays. England is no more English now. Not like it was. And Britain and America are a laughing stock to the rest of the world because they are playing us. Imagine that. The United States of America, a laughing stock to the world, when only a few dec ago, decades ago, we were the most powerful nation on earth. And we had many freedoms which we have now lost. You know, you used to could go fishing without a license. You used to could ride a motorcycle with only a driver's license. You used to could open a restaurant or mow a yard without a license. But not now. Oh no. Everything you do, pretty soon you're going to have to have a license to go to the bathroom. And if I were you, I would keep it up to date. Verse 38. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, but thou shalt gather but little in. In other words, you're going to plant a bunch of seeds, but you're not going to gather anything back. And take this on the spiritual level as well of sowing the seeds of God's word amongst a nation that is so filled with darkness and is against God. For the locust shall consume it. My, my, my. There you go. The locust army. And not only that, the swarmers. You know, if you look up the word Areb in the Strong's Concordance, and you trace it back far enough, you will get two swarmers. But they're only part of the equation. But they're going to eat it all up. And this is part of the four hidden dynasties of the end times, those four systems. The economical, the political, the educational, and the religious systems. All corrupted and perverted. Verse 39. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for worms shall eat them. You know, there's so many things I could go into with this verse. What we alluded to earlier about uh, going and working all your life and paying into SSI and thinking you're going to get something back and not. But not only that, th think about all the things that have come upon the uh, United States recently. You know, canker destroying the citrus industry and uh, plants dying off unexplainedly in parts of the country where they normally plant them, where, where they're normally a crop. I don't care whether it's alfalfa or wheat or whatever. It seems like a nation that's being uh, unblessed, if you ask me. Verse 40. Thou shalt have olive trees in the coast throughout, or, or thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil for thine olive shall cast his fruit. In other words, it's going to fall off the tree. And you know, olive oil is what you anoint yourself with. Deeper spiritual connotation on that too. Not going to be enough anointing oil. Remember the parable of the ten virgins? Think about it. Verse 41. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them. They shall go into captivity. Now, again, historically this happened 
Generations were taken into captivity of Assyria, Babylon, and again, Rome. And in some cases, even in Europe. But modernly, we have the captivity, which is what I alluded to earlier, brainwashing of the children, lack of discipline, and from that comes rebellion. You've got smart-ass kids now who think they know everything, back-talkers, spiteful of their parents, spiteful of their parents' religions. You've even got murderers of their parents, abusers of their parents. But you've got it both ways. You've got parents also killing their kids. Verse 42. All thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume. You know, if you think about the uh, tree spoken of by Christ and John the Baptist, it says all the trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume. It means there's going to be nothing left. Well, we're talking about corrupt trees and good trees. In other words, the good trees are going to be consumed because they can't get the truth out to people. People won't listen to them. And the bad trees are going to be consumed simply because they're teaching false doctrines, leading people astray. Again, every time you see the word locust, it alludes to the locust army of the book of Revelation, either by type, example, or, or literal. Verse 43. The stranger that is within thee, in other words, among us, shall get up very high, and thou shalt come down very low. And you know, there's there's more than one connotation to the word stranger here. Uh, this word would be goy, goyim. And uh, usually it would refer to the ethnos. But you know, the Kenites, the sons of Cain are strangers, and they are among us, and have been among us. It's not just the immigrants. It's not just people of other nations. They or of a different seed line. Verse 44. He shall lend to thee. My, my, my. He shall lend to thee. You know, we've got a monetary system in this country that is run by the uh, Federal Reserve, which is not even a branch of the government. It's privately owned. And guess who owns it? Ta-da! That's right. The good old sons of Cain. And they lend to us and charge us to use those little green paper bills. And thou shalt not lend to him. No, you know why? We can't even pay our back taxes on it. For every dollar that they lend us, they're making money. And we're going deeper and deeper in the hole. He shall be the head and thou shall be the tail. In other words, you've got a total reversal here. So whether you want to take this as the immigrants that are within us that are reaping the rewards of people's labors or the good old Kenites, it's the same thing. They're the head and we are the tail. Luckily, God blesses some of us to be smart enough to know how to make our way even in these times. You don't necessarily have to be a prepper. You just have to be smart. but always be prepared. Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee, in other words, no matter where you go, and overtake thee till thou be destroyed. And here's your reason why. Because thou hearkenest not to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and statutes which he commanded thee. Now, is that simple enough for you to understand and please don't think I'm talking down to anyone. I just want you to understand this, really. You've been given the reason here. People say, why does God do such bad things? Why does God allow us to suffer like this? Why does God allow bad things to happen in the world? Well, there's your answer. You evict God and with him goes his protection and his blessings. And without his protection and without his blessings, 
your meat in the mouth of any who want you. Verse 46. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. Do you understand that? Now that alludes to the cursings and the blessings. You do that which is right in God's eyes, you'll be blessed. You do that which is against God, you're going to be cursed. And some are going to be caught in the middle because they're not quite sure. But moreover, we're referring to the curses here. The reason I injected the part about the blessings is because Anybody can turn from their wicked ways. Anybody can turn things around. At least for themselves, maybe for their family, or anyone they reach. But all these things are going to happen for a sign, and for a wonder, uh, upon thy seed forever. In other words, they're going to happen to you and on your seed forever. In other words, this is a set of... Uh, Uh, well, let's see, what is that word again? <laughs> this is a set of uh, qualifiers, is what it is. It's a set of qualifiers. And they're going to be upon you and your seed forever. In other words, you, you anger God and go away from him, then guess what? It's going to come upon you. Verse 47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for, for the abundance of all things. In other words... God blessed you with so much. Not only did he bless the children of Israel and all who come into contact with them, maybe in ways that they didn't understand, but he also gave us abundance of all things. He gave us a way to salvation through Christ. That's abundance. That's an eternal promise. And people cast it away. Verse 48. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in want of all things. He shall put a yoke of iron around thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. You know, you really ought to consider this, you really ought to read Revelation 2 and 3, especially concerning the church of the Laodiceans, because what have we got here? We've got hunger and thirst, which is famine. you got nakedness, which means you're poor, and in want of all things. And when you're like that, then you're in famine and pestilence. And he shall put a yoke upon thy neck. You know, you could even be talking about the Antichrist here. Because, believe you me, if you're in hunger for the word of God, if you're in thirst for the living water, and you're in nakedness, because you don't have any righteous acts, and you're in want of all things, then the old Satan's going to put that yoke right around your neck. You're going to fall for him, hook, line, and singer. And you're going to fall and worship him and think that he is Jesus' return. Praise God, he's back. Only it ain't him. What's the other part of it? In the fleshly sense, you will work all of your lives and still have want. You won't be able to pay your bills or to afford things. Basically, you will work and not get ahead, much like a slave. You will work, but not reap the rewards for your work. Verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. From the end of the earth, as swift as an eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Do you recall what happened uh, when God divided the speech of men at the Tower of Babel? See, where did that happen at? Let's see. Babel, Babel, Babylon. Historically, you could say this was Assyria or Babylon. But even in both of those, you've got a type. Assyrian, the Assyrian, T. Asher, or the king of Babylon. 
King of Babylon of the end times, the king of confusion. But it's also all of these nations intruding on us to force us into their way, like Sharia law. Or secularism, socialism. Socialism is not a thing of the children of Israel. That came out of old Esau, Edom, Red. And all of these things working together, preparing us for the great deception as one world government rises to welcome its Messiah, the Antichrist. Verse 50. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. In other words, don't matter whether you're old or young, they don't care. Moreover, we're talking about the end time Babylon here. Where, you know, Historically, we're talking about Babylon, Assyria, blah, 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 whatever, even Rome. But prophetically, we're talking about the Babylon of the end times. Because Satan don't care whether you're young or old. He wants you to save you. Verse 51. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed. You know, that's one of Satan's names, the destroyer. which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. You know, if you take the wine from you and the corn, which can also be translated wheat, which is what you make your bread out of, and the oil, Corn, wine, and oil. In other words, you got bread, wine, and oil. That is famine. That's a famine for the end times. A famine not for bread that you eat with your mouth, but a famine for that living bread. And the wine, that's the blood of Christ. We take Holy Communion, bread and wine. But what if you take part of the Wine of fornication of Mystery Babylon. And what about the oil, the anointing oil? Christos, the anointed one. That's all taken away from you. And the increase of thy kind, and thy sheep and thy flocks, until they have destroyed thee. Flocks of what? Flocks of Christians? Flocks of sheep that you eat, or kind? Well, it's all of the above. It's all leading to pestilence and famine, spiritually and fleshly. Verse 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustedest. You remember Ezekiel 13 about the walls that were daubed with untempered mortar? Walls wherein people trust? that God was going to send a whirlwind and furious, fiery hailstones against? That's the wall we're referring to here. Not only the brick walls of the historical, to continue with the verse, throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Verse 53. And thou shalt eat the fruit of of thine own body. Now, do you understand what that means? You're going to consume your own children. And that did happen in the historical type when the king of Babylon came against Israel. The children died. They ate their bodies. They were starving to death. But what does it mean to eat your own children now? To murder them? to allow them to be consumed because you did nothing by secularism, by idolatry, by false doctrines, by man's wisdom. To continue with the verse, the flesh of thy sons and of the flesh of thy daughters which the Lord God hath given thee in the siege and then the straightness wherewith all thine enemies shall distress thee. And you believe you me, they're going to distress you. Verse 54. 
so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother. In other words, the most susceptible. And toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the remnant of the children, which he shall leave. Well, I tell you, this is prophetic, isn't it? The delicate man among you. Yeah, I could go into a lot of things with that word, but uh, he's going to leave his wife. He's going to uh, be against his family. In other words, he's going to leave them. You know what the Bible says about a man who won't take care of his family? He's worse than an infidel. But guess what? When the enemy comes on you, people are going to be turning in father, mother, sister, brother, son, daughter, because they think they're doing the right thing to serve Jesus, only it ain't Jesus. It's Satan. You read your Bible, you should know that. Verse 55. So that he will not give any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat. Because he hath nothing left him in the siege. In other words, everything's been taken away from him. And then the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. Not going to have anything left. Total desolation. Verse 56. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter. Same thing. Verse 57. And toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, that is, the natural birth gate of the woman, I don't need to name it, and toward her children, which she shall bear. For she shall eat them for want of things secretly in the siege, and straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in thy gates. Again, you need to look at the spiritual type of this. Obviously, people did eat their own children during those times in old historical Israel when it was besieged. But people are not going to eat their children in the end times, but they are going to devour them because they're going to join in with the locust army and believe the way that the locusts believe. So they are going to devour their own children. They're going to hand them right over to them. Here you go. Here is my child. Take him unto your love and bosom, Jesus. Only again, it's not Jesus. Verse 58. And here is why, again, the qualifier once more. If thou will not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, which is to say, Yahweh. Verse 59. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful. And the plagues of thy seed, even the plagues of long continuance, and more sickness and of long continuance. In other words, perpetual. The word wonderful there does not mean wonderful. It just means great, massive. Verse 60. Moreover, he will bring all, thee, all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and shall cleave to thee. That's the plagues of Egypt. Now, in the spiritual sense, you know, the plagues of Egypt were put on Egypt for what purpose? To break them down where they would let the people go. Well, why do you think these plagues are being put on the people for not obeying God? So that they come out of Babylon. Verse 61. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, then will the Lord bring on to thee until thou be destroyed. Going to be even new diseases. Never heard of. The bird flu. You know, H1N1. And I'm sure AIDS wasn't heard of then, though it is sort of described there. Plus many other diseases.
and all because people won't pay attention to God. Verse 62, And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of thy God. You know, in the end times, there are 7,000 very elect written of and 144,000 elect. Now, I don't think that those numbers are exactly perfectly right. I think they're for example. But even so, let's say they were right. Or let's say even by example. In a world full of 7 billion people, you know, a million is not a lot. In a world full of 7 billion. 7.3 or 7.4 billion, to be exact. You're going to be few in number. And how many of this world of 7 billion are Christians? And of that many, how many are Christians who know the truth? Aha! Verse 63. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good, and to multiply you, the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people. In other words, this is that word again, goy, goyim. In other words, you're going to be scattered amongst the heathen. Quite frankly, you're going to become like the heathen. You're going to become unlearned. From one end of the earth even to the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Verse 65. And among these nations shall thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing eyes and sorrow of mind. In other words, you're going to be scared. Your eyes are going to fail, which means you're not going to have eyes to see. They're going to fail. And you're going to have sorrow of mind. You know, Paul in 2 Thessalonians told you that he didn't want you to be soon shaken of mind. That's, that's what it is to be sorrow of mind. Not only that, but what's going to happen to you when you're deceived and you find out you were deceived and you approach Christ and say, Lord, Lord, and he says, get out of my sight. I never knew you, ye that work iniquity. Verse 66. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. Hey, you know what? You don't have Christ in your life. You don't have assurance of eternal life. And whether you're atheist or Christian, in this world, with all that's been allowed to happen by the powers that be, you don't have assurance of your life anyway. You could be killed tomorrow. You could be walking out on the street and someone run you down or someone uh, run up and shoot you or rob you or decide to do a hate crime upon you. Verse 67. In the morning thou shalt say, Word to God it were even. In other words, evening. And at evening thou shalt say, Word to God it were morning. In other words, in the morning you're going to say, Oh God, I wish this day was over with. And then at night you're going to say, Oh God, I wish it was tomorrow. And the next day you're going to repeat the cycle. In other words, you're not going to have any peace of mind. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. How many people are perplexed by what we're seeing going on in the world and in our country now? Can you believe some of this stuff is going on? This is not the world we knew only a few years ago. It's certainly not the world I grew up in. Same planet, different world. You know, and, and here is one of my favorite verses here that's used against me on the lost tribes of Israel, and I love it to pieces. I love it, love it, love it. Because people think that this means that it's talking only about one race, and it's got nothing to do with that whatsoever. Verse 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. What is Egypt symbolic of in the book of Revelation and the Bible? Well, it's symbolic of 
bondage and idolatry. Let, let's go ahead and finish the verse. By the way of where I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen. And no man shall buy you. In other words, buy you back. Now, people write me all the time and say, this is what happened to the slaves in Africa. And this one verse is their whole crux. Well, you know what? It also happened to the Israelites. And you know how we know that? Because Babylon and Assyria and Rome all traded in the ocean. And they all took people bondage and they all took ships and they forced people down to Egypt and sold them into bondage. And that's why you have a large contingent of Adamic peoples in the Egyptian culture. Even to this day. But the whole crux of the matter here is you're going to be sold into bondage like as of Egypt. In other words, when it says the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again by ships, what are ships? They're vessels of commerce. Who controls commerce in the world? The Kenites. Tyre and Zidon, they always have controlled it. You're going to be brought into bondage. You know, the word Egypt is used in the book of Revelation to speak of Jerusalem. A lot of people say this is talking about the United States. It ain't talking about the United States. It's really not even talking about Egypt. It's just pointing back and showing you where we've been. You're going to be brought again into Egypt. In other words, you're going to be brought again into bondage. Only what is the bondage of the end times? It's the bondage to Babylon. It's the famine for the end times. It's for not knowing the truth. And that is what this whole thing is talking about. This whole chapter. For what reason are you brought again into bondage? Because you turned your back on God. You know, the United States right now is having more troubles than I think I've ever seen at any times. <clears throat> you know, there's been super outbreaks of tornadoes before, yes, in the 70s and 60s and what have you. But for the last few years we've had that going on. We've got earthquakes, we've got forest fires, and all kinds of flash floods. We're having flash floods all over the place now. Just today in the news, a number of people wiped out by flash floods. You know, and, and I heard one lady say today, we never saw it coming. You really ought to think about the flood of the end times written of in the book of Revelation, which is put out by the dragon. It's against the woman, Mother Israel, and against the remnant of her seed. He is at war with them. Why? Because they have the testimony of Christ. And they're saved by the blood of the Lamb. They have the seal of God, not the mark of the beast. At any rate, I'm sorry that we only did one chapter this time. I know some of you are going to be really disappointed. I'm pretty sure I went over time anyway. And probably this is another long lecture. I can't see the counter to see what it says. But... We'll find out. At any rate, that's where we are going to end. I just wanted to cover this Deuteronomy 28 since I've been talking about it so much. And try, hopefully, to reach a few of you that uh, may be new listeners to see what's going on in your country and in the world and see if this stuff makes sense to you or not. At any rate, as always, my beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ, students of the word, I love you, and I'm happy to have this platform to be able to come to you and teach you. I get some nice comments from people that are very touching to me, and I, I really do appreciate that. 
but give all glory to our Father. I'm just like anyone, a vessel that's been allowed and privileged to be able to teach our Father's Word and to understand some deeper things. But I'm not perfect, I don't know it all, and I'm a sinner. And, uh, you know, we, we can all say that. But whatever you do, most important thing, get into your Father's Word and study to show yourself approved. Use the tools God has afforded us. The Strong Concordant, uh, Concordance. The J.P. Green's Interlinear. The Companion Bible. Smith's Bible Dictionary. All great works. Use them and learn the manners of speech of the ancients. It's going to take you places you never dreamed. But first and foremost, the most important thing you can do, pray to our Father for wisdom, guidance, and understanding because He is the only one that is capable of giving it. And it is His good pleasure to do so if you will but ask Him. And brothers and sisters, always remember to pray for those that walk in darkness. They are the ones that need it the most. And right now, the world is full of darkness and men love it. So pray for them. Plant seeds and do the best you can. May God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.